Morning, friends. Afternoon, morning. Hello, everyone. Mic check. Morning, good morning. Let's do this. Hello, hello. Welcome, my friends, to Alpha Beta Soup. I'm TXMC, and it's a Sunday. It is Sunday, March 24th, 2024. Noon in beautiful Austin, Texas. How's everyone doing today? Thought we'd have a little church day stream. The last few weeks that I've been doing these streams, it's been really difficult for me to get everything I th- I'm looking at and thinking about into one coherent stream. So I thought we'd do another one since we just did one like three days ago. We'll do another one today and just talk about a few more things, you know, that way I don't have to keep you guys here for two hours. That way it's a little easier to watch it back for people who aren't here live and just give us a little more time, right? Not feel like I have to uh, tell you everything on my mind in a, you know, 90 minute block every week. So thanks for being here, everybody. Smash the like button if you haven't already. I'm TXMC. These are just my personal opinions and views. I don't manage money. These are not signals for you. Do your own research. A few things I want to talk about today. We'll kind of look at the price chart here, but um, a couple of topics in particular that I want to touch on. I I want to talk about some on-chain dynamics with Bitcoin, um, how the ETFs kind of play a role in that, and what I think about those things. Uh, And then we also, I want to talk a bit about... A few more thoughts related to the Fed from last week, but not too much because we did spend quite a bit of time on that. Um, but I, don't, I also want to talk about the economy. I want to talk about the deficits. I want to talk about what's going on with growth and GDP. Um, just some things that I've been looking at the last week or so that have me scratching my head. And, you know, I, I, I like to make it clear that when I, when I come on this stream, my goal is not to give you actionable market signals that you can take for your game plan every week and like work into your own market behaviors and stuff. This is just me. I'm trying to understand the world. I do a lot of research. I look at a lot of different things and I need a place to share that stuff. Uh, So this is that platform. So I just want to make make sure I set everyone's expectations. Sometimes I get questions like, yeah, well, what am I supposed to do with this? How do I turn this into a trade? Well, that's not really my job. Uh, My job is just to tell you what I'm thinking, what I feel is important. Sometimes we talk about trades. Sometimes we're just talking about the data and what we think it means, because that is also really important. All right. Let's get into this a little bit, shall we? Let me make sure I didn't miss anything in the chat before we started. No, we're all good. All right. So been watching BTC, right? We we curled at the all time high. We've come down and we're, we're finding some support in this area here. I posted the other day that from my perspective, if we're looking at this on like a four hour chart, we've got four hour 200 EMAs here, which is usually a pretty good representation of the midterm trend. And it's right here, right? It's right at this demand zone. And so what I, what I posted the other day was in an ideal scenario, if we were going to get an ideal dip, uh, the one that I think what I'd like to see would, would have been a quick wick down to take out these lows and then reclaim the moving averages because then you would have taken out all of the stops, gotten a liquidity grab and then reclaimed the trend. Maybe we do that. Maybe we don't. It doesn't really matter. Uh, we could just hold this as support and this could continue the grind higher. Other data suggests that maybe that's what we'll get. Uh, but the other day when I said that <clears throat> we were here. We were right here and I was like, well, maybe this is the moment. Maybe this is the leg because up until this point, you know, if we looked at this, how was it? How was this looking the other day? I was like this when I was looking at it like that, you know, and I didn't have the MAs on here. My thought was, well, structurally, this looks like it's going below 60 K right here, 60 right here. And it just looked like we got lower, high, lower, high, lower, high, lower, low, 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 just structurally it's going down. Right. And so after this, right here, lower high, 
I was like, well, it looks like it just wants to go down here, right? Take out this level, which would be a takeout of 60K, and you would assume this would be the next spot it was targeting. Um, but that's not been what we've gotten the last couple of days. We're actually softening a bit. Maybe uh, maybe that's all she wrote. It's, it's hard to say. You know, there's a lot of people talking about buying the dip, and usually... If everyone is trying to buy the dip, that's usually not the bottom, right? Bottoms aren't typically that easy, but uh, it doesn't have to follow any kind of rule like that. But, you know, when I look across crypto, so on this way down, after this flush, after this flush here in the first week of March, Bitcoin pushed a little bit higher. But from this moment, as I showed you guys the other day on stream, we noticed breadth inside of crypto. A bunch of the names, different coins started declining from this moment. And so while Bitcoin pushed up, there was weakness in the market. And then once BTC broke back down below the prior all time high, all the all the market went with it. And it looked like this right here. This is breadth in crypto. This is names declining rather than advancing. And it happened at the flush right here, right? And then once BTC curled and broke back below that level, it was just lights out and everything declined. However, if we look at both of these, this is a four hour, this is an eight hour. We're seeing an improvement in breadth. I tweeted this last night. We're seeing more names rising. And on an eight hour, it has started to curl. I don't think it has bled through into the 12 hour trend yet. No, let me get that off there. No, it hasn't curled yet on the 12 hour. So hopefully this is a turn that plagues the higher time frames, and we actually see this roll up into strength. But right now we're still kind of watching BTC chop here. This is just an improvement in breadth. This is not a guarantee of a low, but if we go back in time and we look in recent price action, really just the last six months, this has been where lows have been, right? Here, 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 here. All of these have been areas where shortly afterward, price went higher. Now right here, it went higher and then broke down again. So maybe that's what happens. Uh, but for what it's worth, the, the underneath, the data underneath the hood is corroborating the curl we're seeing in price. So Maybe we get a little bit of recovery there. That's just my high-level thoughts right now. No real trade ideas to take away from this. What I want to talk about, though, um, I wanted to touch on that. There, are, I've seen a lot of people kind of pondering how the ETF flows are playing a role in this cycle and if they are changing things. If this bull run is somehow fundamentally different just because we have the ETFs and because we have GBTC offloading all of this supply, right? And it's a valid question, but I, I have a take on it that I have my own take on it. <laughs> so GBTC has been coming alive. Let's look at the ETF flows real quick. Let's just kind of baseline ourselves with the ETF flows. So this is the flow of ETF of the ETFs, the supply in and out of the ETFs every day. All of them in red, all of them minus GBTC's flows in this kind of bluish color uh, since, the, since the ETFs launch in January. And uh, the trend has been following price. So in the background, you see this thin black line. This is the Bitcoin price. And here was the high a couple weeks ago. And the inflows have been following price. And since Bitcoin rolled over, the flows have rolled over. And now the daily inflows, this is one of the lowest daily inflows we've had. I don't know if it's actually the lowest. No, the lowest was a few days ago. 119. No, here was the lowest. Sorry. Mid-February was technically the lowest, 106. But in the last few days, we've had three of the lowest total inflow days we've had to the ETFs. And part of that has been because Grayscale has been dumping precipitously. They started off that way. You know, that was the initial jump with the ETFs. But then we had a lot of inflows at the same time, and they were sort of counterbalancing that. And our net flows, the red line here, was kind of break even. It was choppy, but it was kind of break even. Then the flows in Grayscale, they thinned out, but the other ETFs were still seeing inflows. Uh, so while G while GBTC's out was thinning, the inflows to the others was staying steady, price was rising, and everything started to look really good. But then when we got to a local top in price, as it rolled over, all of this activity rolled over. And then a few days later, not at the top, but a few days later, Grayscale started dumping again 
in big chunks. Uh, part of this, I believe, is from Gemini. But it doesn't even matter where it comes from. Because these flows, they're very public facing, but they represent a behavior that exists in every cycle. In every cycle, when we approach the all time highs, we have long term holders distributing their coins, right? If anyone has followed me for a long time, you are very familiar with these dynamics. Let me show you one of the charts. We'll just pull it up. We'll pull up long-term holder supply. Long-term holder supply. Boom. All right. Some of you may be super familiar with this, but we'll just do a quick high-level overview for those who are not. Long-term holders represent a portion of the Bitcoin supply that has not moved in a a few months. The cutoff date is between five and six months based on historical spending behavior. And once you cross that threshold, you're at a point where the likelihood of a coin being spent again is very low. It's not zero. It just goes down quite a bit. There's like a pocket of supply that's considered that's the opposite of this. That's called short term holder supply. I'll show you that. Uh, Actually, I'll just put it on the chart here. Um, there's another one called short-term holder supply, which is the inverse. And that kind of pocket of supply is always present. I mean, it's always made up of different coins, but it's ever present. And it is a smaller portion than the long-term holder supply, which is in blue up here, but it's ever present. And that, that portion of supply is kind of always churning around and they tend to be newer coins, newer in terms of its age. So when we when we measure data on chain, we like to measure the lifespan of a coin and we can do a lot of different analysis based on that. Right. And that lifespan is based on when the coin last moved. If you know how Bitcoin's accounting works, it works with things that are called UTXOs unspent transaction outputs. And they're basically just a ledger line that contains a certain amount of of units of Bitcoin, a certain amount of Satoshis, actually. Uh, But it could be anywhere from one Satoshi or whatever the minimum of the protocol is, you know, up to many, many Bitcoin. And when you spend your coins on the ledger, it destroys the old UTXO and creates a new one at the new address with, with whatever the spent amount was. And when you do that, the old coin's lifespan gets reset back to zero. So while it was sitting there, it's accruing coin days. So like if you bought a Bitcoin at the top in 2021, let me add the price on here. If you bought a Bitcoin at the top in 2021 back here, every day, like let's say it's one whole Bitcoin, every day that it has sat still, it has acquired one coin day. And then once you spend your Bitcoin, once you spend it to send it to Coinbase or you transfer it to another person or you just you interact with it on the ledger in some way, that lifespan resets all the way back to zero because you have a new line item on the ledger that represents the new balance. And so that's how we measure like whether a coin is old or not is how long it's been since it was spent. And there's always a chunk of supply that hasn't been spent in a long time. And the longer it waits, the lower the odds are that it gets spent again. And so we measure that as long-term holder supply. Those are the hodlers. Those are the diamond hands. Those are the you and me folks who have a long-term bag and we never spend it. And every time we have a bull run, there is distribution out of this group. You see where the blue line starts breaking down? If you really pause and you look at my chart here, pause my video and you look at the chart, It's happening as we're breaking all time highs, right? That's where the distribution starts. And it's people paying themselves for sitting in the market for multiple years and taking on risk, right? Everyone wants to benefit from market exposure. Not everyone is holding their Bitcoin for centuries, like people talk about on Twitter. And so the point I'm trying to get to here, the setup for us talking about GBTC is that every time we have a cycle, long-term holder supply distributes into strength. It is a fundamental component of every bull market. You must transfer supply to new hands. That is a healthy component of turnover in a market. You need that 
in order for new investors to build positions. They have to get the supply from somewhere. And so what we're seeing now, let me take off my red lines. If we fast forward, oh shit. <laughs> we fast forward to today, we are starting to see, let me take this off, we're starting to see long-term holder supply distribute and it started distributing in December. See that? So this is a component of every bull market going back to inception. And the fact that we know this time that it's coming from that a lot of it, not all of it, but the fact that we know that a lot of it is coming from grayscale doesn't make anything different. People like to think that just because we can publicly identify the entity that's doing whatever behavior, that we can then reason with ourselves about how that behavior is different from anyone else who would be spending here and how that must mean that the cycle is different. But it isn't different. It's the same thing that happens every time. We may not have known who all of these hodlers were who were distributing into the new highs of the market, but they happened nonetheless. It occurred nonetheless. That distribution took place. We're seeing that now. If I go show you, let me go fast forward here. So the talk is like, well, whenever these GBTC outflows stop, then we can just go up only. That's what people say. And I've seen this said multiple times. But what I keep coming back to is this behavior is exactly what we normally see. And it's not even outsized compared to the past. So if we take long-term holder spending, which is this line going down, this blue line going down. If I calculate the dollar value of this line going down, and I do that in every cycle past, it's this. Now, in the old cycles, the number, the dollar number was a lot less because the market cap was a lot less. So let's just focus on the last three cycles. In 2017 and 18, and this is a loose approximation because this line Every day there is supply entering long-term holder and supply leaving. So this is a net figure. So it isn't perfect, but we can still do some reasonable calculations with it. So if we take the movement of long-term holder supply and we multiply it by the price at that time, we get a dollar value of their spending. And so in 2018, that was $55 billion. In 2021, it was 107. It was twice as much. Here we are in 2024, we're right at the all-time highs, and we have spent, in a long-term holder capacity, largely the same dollar amount of supply. Isn't that remarkable? That we have all of these, all this ETF flows, there's all these grayscale outflows, it appears that everyone is dumping, and that at any moment it's just going to stop, and, and then the cycle will look normal, and we can go up from here. But this is normal. This is that this is very normal. And what's even more interesting, I think, is if you look at this here, this is where we broke the all time high. That's where we had this consolidation in spending. You see this kind of like thickness in the red right here. Well, look, we're kind of chopping around right here and we are right at the all time high. So it's it's the same shit, guys. <laughs> it's the same behavior every cycle. So no, when the GBTC outflows stop, if they do stop, that won't mean we can then just go up only. They are playing a fundamental role in every what that exists in every cycle. The fact that we can publicly identify the grayscale as the entity as grayscale as the entity contributing much of the flows doesn't change the fact that they are exactly at the moment in the cycle when they normally happen. So on an, from an on-chain perspective, this looks like any other cycle so far from this perspective. Some, some data is a little different, but this one looks the same. And it tells the story that no matter where it comes from, long-term holders come alive in price discovery. There is no universe where hodlers never sell. They always sell. It's just they sell in profit. They don't sell at the bottom of the market like an idiot. That's what makes them different. But they are always present. 
And I think it's just, it's really important that we frame things in a real way and that we don't get wrapped up in the narratives and the color that we apply to a cycle. We can apply all kinds of little narrative seasoning to why things are happening. But if you look at the data, is it any different from the past? No. There are some metrics that are flashing some kind of toppy looks, I want to say. And one of them I started to show you last week, but it was a little rushed, so I'm going to do a better job of it today. Uh, and it was value days destroyed, which is a metric I developed in 2021 to identify market tops. But I developed it back here, and I hadn't really gotten to use it until now. And what it has, what it's showing us, it's spiking up to a very high value. What this, re what this measures is the dollar value of on-chain spending, which is kind of similar to this metric here, but this is specifically the dollar value from just long-term holder supply changing, um, whereas this, this uses a different set of inputs, but it's still ledger activity. And what you can see is that it tends to spike above this, the, the top of the red lines. These lines are based on the amount of time that has been spent below each of them in Bitcoin's life. So above this line, only 5%, says 95%, only 5% of all of Bitcoin's history has taken place with VDD above this line. What's above that line now, right? It's all the way up here at 3.4. And I did some more calculations and I, I found that only 3%, so we're at 5% here, only 3% of all BTC history has taken place with a value higher than this. And it comes very near market tops, but not perfectly. In the past, in past cycles, it nailed it, right? The peak of this metric ended up being the peak of the market, not when it crossed the red line, but when it topped out. In 2017, we had multiple taps. So you take it for what it's worth. It's not a perfect signal, but it is a notable signal. It's something to be, in, to be mindful of, right? And so over here in 2021, it called the top of on-chain activity, which was January of 21. And then here we are spiking again, but spiking a little bit sooner than I would have thought. We're right at the prior all-time high. And when we did this in 2017, it, it, was a, it was at a different place. So like here is where we were when we crossed the all-time high in 2017 and VDD was down here. And here we're, we're crossing the all-time high today and we're up here. So is that a toppy look? I would say it is. From this, from this metric alone, this is a toppy look. So we'll file that under this metric looks a little overheated. There is another one we can look at. Where did I stash it? Is it here? It's here. Okay. Another one we can look at. This is a similar look. But again, it's, it's measuring something slightly different. Um, and it's important that I do that because it, I don't want to just use one metric and then be subjected to nuances and quirks of the way that metric is calculated. So that's why I look at three, four, five different things that measure slightly nuanced different slices of similar activity. This is another measurement of old coin spending. This chart's called spent volume supply relative, and it's it's kind of like long-term holder supply, but it's not quite. And it's just measuring how much, how much coins between the ages of six months and five years, what percentage of them is being spent on a moving average basis, on like a monthly basis. And you can see it has now spiked up above this red line, which I've called high volume, which we've only seen a few times in the past. And it has come at market peaks. And in 2017, kind of similar to the way that my metric peaked twice, two, three times in 2017, we get something a little similar here. Big spike right here. And I believe this was actually around the time of the BCH fork the Bitcoin cash fork. So that could be a little bit of that noise, but then it peaks again right here at the top. It also peaked at the bottom of the market in 2018 when we had a big, there was some on-chain transaction that had a lot of supply, like one transaction that caused this big spike. And then it spiked here, January, 2021, exactly like this one did right here. And we are now above this red line. So again, similarly to the VDD multiple to this chart, it isn't a perfect top caller. It's not going to pixel point you the high of price, but the fact that it's up here is a little concerning. And 
it's up here earlier in the cycle than it was in cycles past, at least two cycles ago. This looks a little bit like 2021, but it's still just ahead of 2021 in that pace. So this one again looks a little bit toppy. This one looks a little bit toppy. And when I look at GBTC flows representing very much similar behavior to past long-term holder distributions, I feel like we are deep into a cycle that's very mature at this point. We have long-term holders distributing. It doesn't matter where they come from. They are distributing. We've got on-chain activity picking up and starting to top out in rates of change on certain metrics. Um, and just generally, we can just see activity is picking up, right? This is one of the core inputs to the VDD metric, coin days destroyed. Remember, I talked to you about the concept of a coin day, how long a single BTC has sat around. Well, when you see this metric spike, it means that a lot of coin days are being destroyed. A lot of coins are being spent. Coins with a lot of history are being spent. And so we're seeing that spike just when it always happens. So from a, from a cyclical perspective, Bitcoin looks like it has looked in all cycles past. We know there are ETFs that changes some of the color, but the actual investor behavior under the hood remains consistent. And that is what we find even when we study other markets is that throughout time, human behavior changes very little. We tend to, to, to express ourselves in the markets in the same way over and over and over again. And you see the same patterns across decades and generations and centuries with different technology, different parts of the world. But the core common factor in all of it is the existence of humans and all of our flaws and our emotions, because fear and greed drive everything. So that's, that's what I wanted to say about Bitcoin. The cycle is continuing as it always has. And the fact that we know that the ETFs are here doesn't change what they are doing, which is providing supply to new investors. Someone said getting ads every three minutes. I actually have the ads turned down. Um, so if they're if you're getting a lot of them, then uh, I'll try to look into that. But I, I have not experienced that. I haven't seen too many people complaining. So if it has, starts happening to a lot of you guys, um, let me know. Uh, someone in the chat context said it's almost 4.20 a.m. here in Australia. Wow. Sorry, buddy. I, you know, I tried to I tried to get this right in the sweet spot, whereas the most amount of people could see it as I could. But maybe I'm just a little too early for my Aussie friends. OK. Next thing. <clears throat> so we're going to pivot now. Let's talk about the Fed, the economy, GDP. I talked to you guys the other day on stream about how I felt that Powell was a bit checked out in the FOMC and how his dovishness was really a surprise because the inflation data is not going down. It's, it's remaining resilient. Let me show you a few of those. Here is headline CPI on a one month in blue, three month in red, six month in yellow, basis. This black line is the year over year figure that always gets reported every month that we hear about. It's a 3.2. But on shorter rates of change, look at the yellow, red, and blue lines. What are they doing? They're accelerating rapidly on an annualized rate. The six month is still behind, but the three and the one month are above four now, which means that unless they fall dramatically, the six month rate is going to be pulled higher and it will be pulled above the year-over-year -year rate, and then the year-over-year -year rate will get pulled up. That's just headline CPI. If we look at core CPI, which excludes food and energy, you see the same dynamic. The year-over-year -year figure is still going down, but on a six-month, three-month, one-month basis, we're picking up steam. And now all three of these are above the year-over-year -year figure on core CPI, 
which means that they will drag the year over year figure higher. These are the same metric, just on faster time frames. So they're going up, the big one's going down, they're gonna pull the big one higher. Core services, same exact kind of thing. It's a little more choppy. It's starting from a higher place, but year over year, slowing down, the, sl- the, the faster rates are all above it now, all of them at five and a half or more. They will pull it higher. But if we look at PCE, which is the inflation of consumption itself, it is still a bit low. It's lower than CPI down at 2.4, but all of those metrics are picking up steam. Now, granted, they aren't all above the year over year figure. They're kind of they're in that range. But it looks like if the month over month is any sign, the last three months have been accelerating two months then we would expect the quarter over quarter figure to do a jump. And then if that ace holds, the the uh, six month figure will jump. And that now would drag up year over year PCE. If we look at PPI, now we're going further up the chain here, right? PPI comes before CPI, CPI comes before PCE. So PPI, producer prices, those are the input prices, right? For manufacturers and producers. And then you get the actual price changes, the CPI, and then you get people buying the stuff that has the higher prices. So it feeds through in a process. So it starts out with PPI. PPI has been negative for the last year and a half on a, on a moving average basis. But in the last six months, the year over year figure is starting to pick up a bit and we're seeing more chop in the slower rates of change. This one is less conclusive, but it's just showing that we're, we're returning back to a kind of baseline. PCE might be accelerating a bit, but it will do that after the prices accelerate. And those look like they're starting to drift higher. For all the talk about how shelter is super lagged and how it's the thing that is the reason why CPI is still high, these rates of change are picking up. That's not going to be a good bleed through to the year over year core CPI figure at all. If we look at the changes inside the basket, like individual pieces inside the basket, uh, here, median, and trimmed mean. These are two of the adjusted CPI figures that come out of the regional feds. And what they do is like the median CPI takes all of the components of the CPI basket and it finds the one in the dead center and it shows you the rate of change of that piece. Trimmed mean takes the average of all of the things in the CPI basket, but cuts off the stuff at the very extremes, the things moving the most and falling the most. And those two figures are both accelerating. You see the blue bars making new highs? You see that? They're picking up pace. Core services, core, all of them are picking up pace. We are heading towards a period where we risk reinflating. I don't think that it will drive us straight back to eight or 9% CPI, which is what we topped out in year over year in 2022 but it will be a reacceleration if these things play through. And and you can see this also, remember guys, we talked just the other day about gasoline prices. I think I showed it on stream just real briefly when I was hopping around the other day. Look at gasoline prices, up 37, 38% off of the lows in December. That has not yet bled through into energy CPI. That's one of the fundamental inputs to households every month, right? Gas prices. And so we're seeing concerning inflationary data, but we just had a Fed cont- telling us that they're ready to, they want to start cutting this year and that they think financial conditions are restrictive. They think financial conditions are restrictive and the NASDAQ has been doing this, going straight the fuck up. So I found it kind of interesting and and I said, okay, well, what is financial conditions? What, what do those look like, right? So the Fed has a couple of different measures of financial conditions, it turns out. And what's interesting about it is they are not agreeing with Jerome Powell at all. So this comes from the Chicago Fed. This comes from one of his own regional banks. It's the Chicago Fed Financial Conditions Index. When it is going down, 
conditions are easing. When it's going up, conditions are tightening. So what you could see in 2022, financial conditions tightened into the first part of the year. And then about March of 2023, which is right after the banking crisis last year, the mini banking crisis, financial conditions have been easing, according to this metric, ever since. And they are now all the way back down to where they were before Jerome Powell raised interest rates. Look at that. Where's my little drawing tool? Where's my drawing tool? Oh, my. I need to stop moving this around. Look at this. You see this right here? That's February of 2022. Here was the first rate hike. Right here. Middle of March. Financial conditions are easier today than they were when the Fed funds rate was still at 0% in Q1 of 2022. That is fucking mind-blowing. There's another metric. The Fed, the Federal Reserve proper, not the Chicago Fed, but the big Fed, they created this other metric, a new index to measure financial conditions. They came out with it last year. It's slightly different. And it started to show conditions easing, but this data actually ends a few months ago. So I found my buddy Craig Shapiro on Twitter, a good follow if you're looking to follow somebody. CES921 is his Twitter handle. Uh, oh, it says I don't follow Craig. Weird. I don't even know that I don't follow people sometimes because all of his posts show up in my uh, all of his posts show up in my feed. Um, this is that metric here. So here is the the Fed created another financial conditions index, not this one but a different one. So it's been updated now to the most recent data. And what is it showing? Financial conditions falling since the beginning of 2023. So Jerome Powell stood at the pulpit a few days ago and gaslit the entire American economy because he told us all that financial conditions are easing, that inflation is heading in the right direction, but they want a little bit more data and that they expect to start easing sometime this year. But we have a complete cratering of financial conditions in, in, to the easy side, right? They're becoming softer. They're becoming more friendly. Though that value, according to the Chicago Fed, is lower than it was before the hikes ever began. And Powell says, yeah, we need a little more data. Need a little more data, but we're still going to hike. I'm mean, sorry. We're still going to cut. We're definitely going to cut. We're going to cut later this year, but we have accelerating CPI. And a few of the Fed governors have come out recently and said that they only think the Fed should cut once or twice this year. Well, the dot plots show three cuts. The market as recently as a month ago, still expected five, six, seven cuts. They just recently were convinced that three is more realistic. But now that we've gotten the market to three, people like Raphael Bostic and Tom Barkin and uh, one of the other ones, they have all come out and said they don't think that we should cut three times. Uh, Raphael Bostic just said that a couple of days ago. Bostic rate cuts. Let me see. Bostic scales back to single rate cut inf on inflation concerns. So Powell now is going to have to convince his own board that they need to pivot financial policy, monetary policy, in a year when we have all that data that we just covered together. In a year where we have record low unemployment. It's still pretty low. It's risen a bit, but it's still very low. It's sub four. We have sub 4% unemployment and Powell insists that we're going to have to start cutting rates this year. And some of his board members are going, eh, I don't know about that, dude. So there's going to be some dissent among the board. And that's interesting because almost every, I think every Fed vote for the last two years has been unanimous. There's been no dissension. And uh, that's just a little odd, right? Even Volcker had some dissension when he first came into the Fed. And so I, I'll be really interested to watch how this plays out this year um, to see how the data supports whatever narrative the Fed is trying to push. Um, I feel like the, the press conference that Powell gave last week is probably one of his most disingenuous of his tenure, at least in the post-COVID era. Um, 
because he he just boldface gaslight gaslit all of us by telling us that financial conditions are restrictive. And I don't know what measure he's using because two measures directly from the Fed show the opposite of that. And then if you look at the stock market, it's a third, a third thing saying, no, you're wrong. So I don't know. Part of it, I think, is because we are in re-election season because Janet Yellen's boss is up for re-election. The head of the Treasury's boss is up for re-election. We're running massive deficits and that that cost is eventually going to be punitive. But also, I think that there is a reticence to sacrifice the Goldilocks economy, right? We talked about this some last week. I'll put it, I'll put it back up here on um, CPI. Let me put it back up on here so you can see it. One second. So here's CPI. Let's do percent change from a year ago. And then we'll add a line. Sorry, let me close this. Add a line. Oh, user-defined line. And we'll make it two, two. Okay. So here's CPI and here's the Fed's mandate in this red line here. Oh, whoops. Here's the Fed's mandate in red. The blue line is CPI. What they have shown to us now is that they are not willing to sacrifice the Goldilocks economy that we have right now just to make this blue line touch the red line, even though the red line is their mandate. So it has now been hovering above it since June of last year when we talked about peak disinflation on here. That was the right call to make. And we made that call using this type of analysis, looking at rates of change inside the CPI basket for one month, three month, six month annualized rates and comparing that to year over year. That's exactly how we got to that conclusion. So now we're doing the same analysis and it looks as if we may be at the cusp of a reacceleration in CPI. Not a massive one. It doesn't have to look like this, but even just going up one more full percentage point into the fours would be very bad for the Fed. It would really threaten their credibility. <clears throat> and uh, I think it's because the administration wants to keep this Goldilocks economy floating for the rest of the year as much as possible. And they probably are applying pressure to the Fed. The Fed is an apolitical organization by its intent, but it rarely is. You can find a lot of evidence throughout history of Fed chairs being pressured by presidents, LBJ and uh, William McChesney Martin, Richard Nixon and, and Arthur Burns, uh, all of those things. Even, even slightly Carter and uh, Volcker for a short period of time. But, and then Trump and Jay Powell, right? So it, it, that they are always being pressured politically. And the, the, the concerning thing is that we, we have fairly solid GDP, but more and more of that GDP is being supported by government spending. So where, which, where did I hide this? <laughs> so I have so many of these things. Sorry, guys. Uh, is this it? This could be it. Yeah. So first let's look at the deficit. So right now we're running a 7% deficit, right? It's massive, massive deficit. And we're running a seven or 8% deficit, meaning percent of GDP. We're running, uh, our deficit is about seven or 8% of GDP, which is historically high outside of a crisis. Actually, let's start with this chart. Historically high outside of a crisis. These black dots represent the deficit of the last four years. The deficit is on the x-axis, getting deeper as you go to the right. And what you can see is the deepest deficits we've ever had were during wars, during World War I and World War II. Those were the deepest deficits we ever had. Unemployment is on the y-axis. So as it goes up, we have more unemployment. So during these world wars, we had very low unemployment, sub two, and we had very deep deficits, more than 10% of GDP. We had something similar in the GFC, but unemployment jumped up and the deficits expanded, right? But then here we are in COVID and COVID is a crisis of its own. It's not a war though. And we have these massive deficits running with relatively low uh, unemployment. 
We had high unemployment in 2020. It averaged 8%, even though the high was, I think, uh, 14 or 15%. It averaged 8%. But even as the unemployment has come down, the deficit has stayed over 5% each year. Very huge deficits. And if you look back in time, these are the deepest deficits we've ever run outside of a crisis. And they are the deepest deficits outside of a war with low unemployment. And... So I, I, I've been thinking about this, and, and the reason I've been thinking about it is because of this, beha- this, this relationship. So the deficit on this chart is in black, and unemployment is in blue. It's just another way of looking at the relationship that we saw over here. And what you can see is, since 1900, unemployment is upside down, by the way. So when it spikes down, unemployment is growing. This is the Great Depression. Unemployment fell to 20-25%. And then a few years, and that started preceding expanding deficits, right? But let's not use 1933 as our best example. Let's just look from basically since World War II, which is basically all this period right here. Notice how whenever the deficits grow, it's usually because unemployment is also growing. And then as unemployment recedes, that's the blue line going up. The deficit gets smaller. That's the black line going up right here. This is the surplus we ran in the Clinton years right before Bush became uh, came into office, uh, right around the time Bush came into office. And since then, the deficit has continued getting bigger, but unemployment has recovered. So this is the only time in this whole history here where, imp- where deficits have continued expanding while unemployment is going in a good direction. It's going the right way. So we've got this big gap right here. And so I saw this chart the other day and I was wondering like, hmm, that doesn't look so good. How much of our current economic growth is the deficit, right? Like we should know that. So I ran those calculations. Here is kind of a messy chart that shows real GDP contributions. So the black line is real GDP. There's a zero here. Let me put a little, uh, let me put a thing on the zero so you can see it a little better. Okay. Dashed line is zero. These are things contributing to GDP. Blue is personal consumption. That's you and me buying stuff. Historically, that is about two thirds of GDP. It should be. That's most of what our economy is, is you and me buying shit. Then we also have net imports, no, sorry, net exports, imports and exports, private domestic investment, you know, building factories and things like that, and then government spending. And what you'll notice about government spending is that since the end of 2022, it has been playing a pretty large role in GDP. And so I thought, well, that's that's a little odd. What is the actual share of GDP? Because I can see this yellow taking up a bunch of this box right here. And that number, it's right here. This is the percent of the change in real GDP, quarter over quarter, that is created by government spending. It's the government expenditures contribution to the change in real GDP. So if real GDP goes up 3%, and the government expenditures are 50% of that, then the government expenditures are 1.5% of the 3% of GDP. And so in middle of 2022, the deficit was 56% of real GDP. And currently we're basing out around 25 or 30%. As recently as the middle of last year, it was full on a third and now it's down to about 20, 25%. We'll see what it is. We'll get, well, as revisions come in, this number will adjust a bit. And then once we get the Q1 2024 numbers, we'll be able to add to this, to this. And it only goes back to 2020. I didn't pull the data series going back forever. But I can tell you that this is a pretty high figure. For the deficits in an, in an expansion, in a peacetime expansion with unemployment sub four, For the deficit to be 25% of GDP is massive. So if you were to just strip that away, we would lose a quarter of our GDP instantly. That is not a strong economy. 
No matter what you try to say, no matter what you say about the labor market, no matter what you say about real incomes, that's not a good place for us to be in because of the, 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 because of this relationship. What if we actually have a spike in unemployment? What if this blue line actually comes back down here to six or eight or worse? Where does the deficit go? The only reason we pulled this off is because it was World War II. Are we going to do that again? It, I, I don't, this, this, is, this is a major red flag for the cycle, right? This isn't something you can trade. This isn't something that has like a really timely aspect to it. Um, who knows like how this plays out. But this, this is 125 years of history and that has not happened before. At, to this level, this multi-year expanding of deficits while unemployment continues to improve. And it's currently, you know, the deficit is currently propping up a third of the economy. Very concerning. You can find this data here by doing contributions to real GDP, and you can go to the BEA website here. You can go to tables. And uh, now, so yeah, you can go, you can go in there. I've, you can go in there. I think and there's a, there's a table. Maybe it's in there. Sorry, I'm getting a little turned around here. There's a table in there and you can look in one of the uh, sections is contributions to real GDP. And it'll show you all of these pieces uh, that I talked about here. Personal consumption, net imports domestic investment, and it'll show you how much, that's what these figures are, how much it's contributing to the change in real GDP. And so in Q4, we had 3.2% real GDP and 0.73 of the 3.2 was the deficit. Let me take a sip of my water here. Let me catch up with the chart. Sorry, <laughs> let me catch up with the chat. Uh, and then um, I'll give some kind of Closing thoughts on this monologue here today, and then I'll get to any questions you guys might have. If you do have questions for me, make sure you say Alpha Beta Soup, because then it highlights your name in the chat, and I can see it easier than if you say TX. Uh, Karen asked before the stream, have I ever sought confluence with esoteric data for my research thesis? Uh, well, I mean, I guess it depends on what... Um, what esoteric data you talk about. I feel like I look at a lot of data on here. Uh, what's my opinion on waters above analysis? I'm not sure, Luigi. I guess I'm not familiar with that. I'll have to read that. <clears throat> Brent from the dollar milkshake theory thinks we'll have a pullback in Q2, but no recession and bull into the fall. Yeah. So what I talked about with you guys last week, and, and I, I, I want to add a little bit more color to this because I don't want it to be misconstrued. I said that when we have a Fed YOLOing into inflationary growth with massive deficits and accelerating CPI, um, it means it means that inflation is probably not going away anytime soon. It's going to stay sticky the way that it has because they're not going to do anything to really tamp it down. They're not going to try to make the blue line touch the red line. And so what that should mean on balance with all things being equal what that should mean is that inflation sensitive assets go higher, right? Risk assets should probably go higher. BTC should go higher. Gold should go higher and bonds should do poorly. That's that's with all things being equal. That should be the dynamic. But we know that not all things are equal. This is a wild cycle. There is a lot of different things going on at once. Um, so. It's hard for me to just fully get behind the idea that, well, if the Fed's YOLOing into inflation, that we're just going to moon into the rest of the year, minus like a small correction. If we get that, I'll be ecstatic. That'll be great for all of our bags. But it just seems like a lower likelihood possibility, considering that we are already up so much that everything has gone up so quickly. It's hard to imagine that it just continues for nine more months. Uh, may again, Perhaps it does. But when I when I think about the fact that we've got a lot of bill issuance coming up soon, the, the Ye Yellen has deficits to fund. Um, we're seeing retailers 
guiding down for the rest of the year, like Nike, Lululemon, uh, a couple of other ones whose names are they're, they're blanking right now. Um, they guided down on their expectations for the rest of the year, citing a weakening consumer. And there's other data points that look really weird. Like there's, um, whereas do I have the KC labor market? Yes. So this is a labor market conditions index that comes out of the Kansas City Fed. And it's breaking down really hard in a way that we've only seen in the past three recessions that this metric has existed for. Um, it's just hard for me to see. And, and additionally, the rates of change of labor that we've been watching this whole time, right? Uh, where is it at? The, uh, yeah, employment composite. Oh, sorry. Where is it? This slowdown in employment growth, right? Commensurate with past recessions. Seeing that, seeing this, knowing that the deficit is currently a third of the economy, and then we have these retailers expressing concerns about consumer strength for the rest of the year, it feels like we're we're near the highs, the, the highs uh, in plural. Um, it's hard for me to think about a whole other leg higher than this. Um, I'll stay long. I don't, I'm not going to go short uh, based on my feeling. But just to come, if I take all of this holistically, I see yields being pressured higher in the short term, right? If you just look like, and that in itself makes it hard for me to be bullish on risk assets. Like just look at the 10 year. This level was the level from the low of equities, October, 2022. And look at the structure. It's bending back. It looks like it wants to go higher. And the only time it was higher was right here. And this was last year when we had a really nasty sell-off was right here. And then we made a low, a higher low. And now we're curling back up. It looks to me like the magnet for yields is up here, right? If you're just looking at this from like a, a physics perspective, it looks like it's pulling it up here. Like this is where it wants to go. Um, and so if, if we get above this level here, I can't imagine that's good for risk. Maybe that's the correction that someone like Brent Johnson's talking about. Maybe that's what he sees. I, I don't know. I can't speak for him. Um, but then are we just going to turn around and keep mooning higher? I, I don't know. I, maybe we'll deal with that when the time comes. I don't want to sit here and try to do a bunch of predicting um, because I don't have a great track record of predicting. And that's there's just no real va There's no alpha in doing that. But just uh, assessing all of the data where it stands, it feels like we're very overheated. And so if equities correct, I think we have to see what that looks like before we decide what the rest of the year is capable of. Um, but yeah, very conflicting data. We've got a, 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 a Fed chair saying one thing, financial conditions index is saying something completely different. He says we're waiting for more data on inflation, but the inflation data continues to look like it wants to reaccelerate. Yields are hanging around near cyclical highs. And we've got a bunch of debt issuance coming this year to help fund these massive peacetime deficits that are currently a third of GDP. Sure, bull market. Uh, are you on any other platform where I can get more of your content and support you? Kevin, I am here on this Twitter, or I'm sorry, on this YouTube account that you're watching right now. And I have my Twitter account, TXMC Trades. That's it. That's all I got. If you'd like to support the channel, you can be a subscriber to YouTube. You could also consider getting a channel membership, which is totally not necessary, but some people have chosen to do that to show extra support. And so we do a member stream once a month. We'll probably do one of those at the end of the week. Um, so if you want to participate in that, you're welcome to, but I, I won't ask you to do that because uh, it's just totally up to you. All right. I'm catching up with the chat, catching up. Dennis says... Feds Powell says he's ready to support the job market amid rising unemployment, even if it means higher inflation for Americans. Is that a headline? Like if I search that on Google, is that a headline? Oh shit, it sure is. Uh, 
Fed's Powell ready to support job market, even if it means lingering inflation. Issued his opening statement declaring that a super increase in unemployment could prompt the Fed to lower rates. This is not alpha, though. Like, Fed Chair Powell used his opening statement at Wednesday's press conference to declare that a surprise increase in unemployment could prompt the Fed to lower rates. Well, that's their job. Their mandate is full employment. So if they no longer have full employment, they will see that as a trigger to adjust policy. So I, th I think that's kind of like a common sense kind of observation from this particular writer here. Kyron says, Alpha Beta Soup, when moon? <laughs> got it. Someone's always got to ask. Someone's always got to ask. Alpha Beta Soup, late to the stream, and maybe you addressed this, but do I think gold is sending a risk-off signal? Yeah, I think it is. I think it is, to a degree. Um, it, you got to wonder, is it turning the prior all-time high into support here? You know, we've looked at this before. When gold takes off, oh, sorry. When gold takes off, that is usually not a good sign for risk assets. When it trends hard, that's usually not a good sign for risk. It's usually happening at a poor time. Um, I do think that I do think that gold is lost a bit of its signal, maybe compared to uh, a couple decades ago, a decade ago, just because you know it's a very outdated form of money at this point in an increasingly digital world. And I, I don't, I don't think that it plays the same role in investors' minds that it always has for all investors. Some certainly, but, um, and I think because the derivatives market for it is so large, um, that it's hard to really know how much of the signal is, is spot buying of gold versus some derivatives you know, action. And I don't, I don't try to figure those things out, but when I see it mooning in the way that it has been lately in the context of what's going on around it, it's very concerning to me because it should be doing the opposite. It should be like ranging or underperforming, but it's actually doing, it's going, it's continually pushing higher. Uh, so yes, I, it concerns me as a signal. I don't think it, it is a pristine, perfect, all encompassing signal, but it, it should be something we pay attention to. My thoughts on BTC weekly adjusted for inflation. I I don't I don't really find these kinds of um I don't I don't really find adjusting things for inflation uh like price charts for inflation to always make a lot of sense. Um but yeah, I mean that's kind of interesting that it's that it's kind of triple topping you know, the, for now, it appears to be pseudo triple topping here at a break even point for, you know, inflation adjusted Bitcoin. Um, sure. I think it's interesting. I also think that people use it, not you, but I think I see on Twitter, people often use inflation adjustment on the stock market as some kind of a coping mechanism for us not being at all time highs. Oh, well, we're not at inflation adjusted highs. Uh, that's true. But who the fuck's buying stocks because of inflation? Like literally to hedge inflation. So I, I just look at the S&P. I just look at the nominal price of the stock market. Because also, I mean, if you, if you, if you adjust it by this CPI basket, you are then introducing all of the nuances of the calculation of the CPI basket and all of the different ways that it changes over time. And so I don't really like doing that. I'll do it with other economic measures um, because I think it it's it has a it's more familial there. You know, like I might do it over some kind of a measurement of a sales figure or something in manufacturing or something like that. Um, but I I don't really personally spend a lot of time putting it against price charts. Uh, would I mind explaining my relationship with Glassnode in the past? Yeah, sure, Oscar. Uh, I worked at Glassnode. So in 2021 and early 22, for about four or five months, I worked for them um, in a content capacity. I helped 
build some of the content that went into their knowledge base where they define all their metrics and things like that. I did a few week on chain newsletters. I think if you go back, actually, uh, let me go find it real quick. I'm going to look on my other screen here and then I'll pull it over. Give me one second. Um, I think if you go back to their um, 2021 videos, you'll find um, you'll find my on chain that I did in 2021. Uh, I don't know where it is though. Oh yeah, week four of 2022. Scrolling back. Let's see here. I'll bring it. I'll bring it over here so we can look together. Let me see. If, where is it? What's going on here? Okay. It was in like November of 2021. Oh, wow. It's it's one of these in here. I'll figure out what it is and maybe I'll tell you guys later. Um, but one of these in here, either, no, you know, somewhere between November and December, I did a couple of these. Uh, so it's my voice you hear rather than checkmate. Um, and I worked for there for a few for, for a while, but uh, I it, we just we didn't we didn't have the same like goals in mind. And we just, you know. Went our separate ways. I still uh, friends with those guys. You know, I talk to Checkmate pretty often and I ask him questions whenever there's something about the data I don't know because I can go right to him and I don't have to like submit a <laughs> support request. Uh, but yeah, I, I worked there for a while and I'm, I'm proud to say that I, I feel like one of the foremost experts on on-chain data in the world because I worked there and I got to be friends with Checkmate and I got to see behind the curtain and it really gave me insights that I, I don't that I think a lot of folks just didn't don't have the, the privilege of having because they haven't gotten to work for a company like that there are others you know there's I have friends who work at Glassnode there's people who work for CryptoQuant people who work for The Block people who work for Coinmetrics they are also very knowledgeable um, and but it, it, there's a very tiny number of people who actually have done the work to really understand how on chain operates, how it, how it's functions, how it's calculated and how to apply it in analysis. Um, and I'm, I'm glad to be one of those people. Blockchain backers on vacation. Thanks for filling the void in my life with no markets in the morning. <laughs> sure. Thanks. Zero. Cool. Uh, Rich says your I can change her comment on Emma Pike's video is creepy and sexist. I should apologize and do better. Well, I'll, I'll do none of that. She said something real dumb and she's an attractive female. And so I trolled with the reply. I can change her. If you think I'm a sexist for that, I don't know what you're, I don't even know what you're talking about. It has nothing to do with sexism. Women say the same thing about creepy dude videos. I can change him. It's just a joke, man. Uh, Beeskeet says, that's literally how I got into investing in the stock market. My savings account was losing money against inflation. Oh, from, from Bitcoin? Yeah, maybe so. All right. So I think, I think what, I'll, what I'll kind of cap this with is... Something that I've been thinking about and trying to figure out how to like put it into words is I think that parts, part of the reason why this cycle has really thrown people for a loop uh, in some regards is because the sequencing, the timing of the arrival of the Fed came at a different point than when it has normally arrived. So here, I'll, you know what I'll do? Rather than paraphrase, I'm going to pull up my tweet where I said something about this the other day, and then I'll, I'll add some more onto it. I think I retweeted it this morning. Where did I put it? Here we go. So I'll read this, and then I'll, I'll add some color for you guys. I think a major reason why that this cycle has bamboozled so many recession calls is because the Fed's hikes came at a different time. They came late. Usually hikes begin early in an expansion and they follow the market up along with long-term rates. That's something that a lot of people get wrong. They think that rates going up is bad for the market, but historically rates slowly grind higher with the market, with the economy into an expansion until they reach a high point. 
This time, the Fed first hiked deep into a recovery, and they began at the top of the market. That's anomalous in basically all of history. Hold on a second. Pritch, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I just don't care about this. So I'm just going to get rid of these stupid comments. It's, this is completely irrelevant to what's going on right now. Where are you? Here. Bye. Um, this time they hiked deep into a recovery and they began at the top of the market. It's anomalous because in basically all of history, anyone who used temporal sequencing, meaning like time since the yield curve inverted, time since this thing happened, time since the first rate hike, anyone who used things like that, they could have been thrown for a loop because this cycle started with all time easy policy, all time, right? We're running full bore post pandemic COVID QE stimulus with 0% interest rates. And we rained stimmy checks down on everybody in 2021. And then one year later, the Fed with the market at all time highs says, now I'm going to start tightening. And then they didn't. And that was after unemployment had already returned to cyclical lows. Right. Like, let's go pull up the unemployment rate real quick. Unrate. So here's where the Fed started hiking rates. Right here. They waited for unemployment to come all the way back down before they started raising interest rates. In prior cycles, that's not usually the case. They don't usually wait multiple years after a recovery, you know, a recovery is deep. We're deep into a recovery, excuse me, um, before they start raising interest rates. Hiking cycles are usually two years long. I don't think many people have studied the sequencing of these past cycles enough to see this. Only a few that I personally follow. And I think it means that we should be prepared for a bigger cycle, maybe the biggest ever in terms of time span, which makes it hard for me to wave and all clear on the economy when I've seen what I have. And someone asked what bigger cycle meant. So I added and I said, by a bigger cycle, what I really mean is that we're elongating the response function of indicators that signal recession. So when you say the yield curve has been inverted for more time than ever in history and we still don't have a recession, or PMIs have been in contraction for X amount of months and we still don't have a recession, or leading indicators of the economy are showing a recession for two years but we still don't have one, that makes a lot of sense. Every function of the economy that reacts to policy will be stretched out relative to a normal cycle because the Fed itself arrived later than normal. They came after the recovery. They came after unemployment came all the way back down. They came after borrowers termed out all of their debts in record numbers, refinancing homes and businesses and corporate debt. Just two years after a pandemic broke every single chart in existence. So maybe we should expect the bleed through of policy into the economy to feel longer, even if it occurs in a similar distance to when the Fed actually arrived. And a lot of people expected a recession in 2022 or the beginning of 2023. But the reason that that was wrong is because that would have been the fastest in history ever, not counting the COVID shock, which was literally like a two month doom plunge and we bounced right back out of it and it was all artificially driven. But if we were going to have a recession as a result of the Fed raising interest rates, 2022 or the first half of 2023 would have been the fastest it ever happened. And people were wrong for under misunderstanding that timing, but because they were too early on those calls, now they are abandoning all of those calls, but because nothing has gone bad, but the cycle is still unfolding, as you know, here on the channel, as we've studied at length. And so there is a risk that early and wrong doom calls become early and wrong victory calls. 
I can show you a couple of data points. I've been trying to think, how can I visually show you that the Fed came in later than normal? And that's difficult to do. It's difficult to chart that. But like we pointed out here, they didn't start raising rates until unemployment was all, we were already at maximum employment. And they were still running QE this entire time, right? And then they just all they abruptly turned it off and reversed everything. But hiking cycles and the effects they have on the economy are typically two years long. This is the average amount of months of a Fed hiking cycle going back to the 50s, 19 months 24 months in 2007 and 2009. I could even include COVID on here, I think. COVID had a really long tightening before we actually got to COVID. And then they backed off backed off of a little bit of it before the actual pandemic hit. But there was a tightening that ended in 2019. And I consider that part of the 2020 cycle because there were many other things that happened in 2018 and 19 that suggested maybe a recession was on deck. And then we had COVID. So we don't actually know how it would have played out. So I actually consider that a full cycle. And so if we just average all these out, it's about 19, 20 months. And our current tightening cycle was only 16 months. It ended in July of last year, went from March to July. But it didn't begin until March of 2022, right? But there are, like, what did, what did I just say about the yield curve? The yield curve has now been inverted, I think, more time than ever, right? I think, I think it's the longest we've ever had a yield curve inversion. Yield curve inversion longest. Yeah. Longest yield curve inversion on record and no recession. Well, I was just saying, well, the Fed came in late. So maybe we need to expect the Fed arrived later than normal, which means policy changed later than normal, which means every function of the economy that reacts to policy should be stretched out relative to a normal cycle. So we've got record long yield curve inversion. We've also got, what else do I have? I have another chart of it here. Where's my man PMI chart? We have 16 consecutive months of the man manufacturing the ISM ISM manufacturing PMIs being below 50, being in contraction 16 months. That's the longest we have ever had without a recession. If you look at the conference board and their leading indicators, which I don't have a chart of right in front of me, it has been in contraction for like almost two years, which is the longest it has ever done so without an official recession. But we know here together as we've looked Rates of change in the labor market don't look great. They are softening. They're going the wrong direction. They just haven't bled through into the headline number yet. And the headline number is what the market will react to. So they're not, they're ignoring that for now. But there's a lot of this hemming and hawing about, well, PMIs have been in contraction for 16 months and no recession. Maybe the PMIs are broken. The yield curve has been inverted for the longest on record and no recession. Maybe the yield curve is broken. And, and there's all these people are having all these theses, all these different things that they're saying. But but what I keep coming back to is that the Fed like here, we'll just use real sales. We'll use real sales as a barometer. Real retail sales is something that goes into contraction in every economic downturn, even the ones that we don't have recessions in. And it happens before every recession. Some of you who watched my uh, recession roundup videos last summer, excuse me, <laughs> last summer, <clears throat> you saw that the cyclical pieces of the economy, I don't know why I'm hopping around, the cyclical pieces of the economy, they contract first, industrial production, real manufacturing sales, real retail sales. So if we use that as a barometer for the, the arrival of Fed tightening in the same cycle, right? Going back to 1957, let me take off 87 here. Now, I've got every uh, cycle in here, including the 1966 soft landing, which we have been using on this channel here as our barometer for, where's the yield curve? Here it is. As our barometer for our likelihood to look like a soft landing, right? This is 1966 in purple. So I have 1966. I also have 1994, 95, which is the Greenspan soft landing that everyone always heralds as some amazing achievement of central banking, but had no recession. It was about a year long tightening. 
And in all of these instances, in every single one of them, the Fed started raising interest rates many months before real retail sales peaked for the cycle. Months before, in some cases, two or three years before. Except this time. It was two and a half months after the peak of real retail sales. Huge disparity. The only other one that's remotely close is the Volcker recession. So we've talked on the channel here quite a bit about how Fed responses in inflationary cycles are usually delayed. They were delayed this time. They were delayed in the 70s. And, they've, and they create consistent dynamics. And here we are again in a cycle where everything feels stretched out, where everyone was really early to calling recession. It didn't happen because that would have been the fastest that it ever fucking happened. And now they've all given up on that and said everything's great. But we still have all of these normal signals like PMIs and yield curves and real cyclical measures of the economy that haven't created new highs yet. They're still in contraction. And everyone's thinking, well, maybe, maybe those metrics are just broken. Well, maybe people's assessment of this cycle is broken. Maybe they don't have the right temporal anchor. Maybe the anchor is the Fed itself. And maybe, perhaps, the best way to measure a cycle is based on when the Fed starts tightening. And relative to when the Fed started tightening, job growth has slowed down faster than any other period. So, we are still in a pickle of our own making that is the fallout from the COVID excesses. We have everyone hyper-focused on Fed policy, but very, very few people, in my opinion, have done the hard study to really understand the linkages and the sequencing in what precipitates a downturn in the economy, what brings it about. And all of their timing is wrong, and now they have all given up on that idea. And perhaps we have a soft landing. Maybe the Fed easing in 2024 with inflation at 3%, maybe that is their way of securing the soft landing. Maybe that's what they have to do. We'll find out as time goes on. But relative to historical past, re relative to the past, this is setting up for a very big cycle, a huge cycle in terms of the time span that it has taken for everything to unfold. And a massive rug pull in what people thought would happen. I, I don't know what that means for stocks. I'm not going to try to guess that, but the rate, the, the momentum inside the economy is really concerning. <clears throat> and when you add on the, the real GDP problem that we saw earlier and how a third 25, 30% of it is strictly government deficits, uh, it really makes you question the, the staying power of the U.S. economy in 2024 and into next year makes you really question. So that is what I wanted to get off my chest today. If you haven't hit the like button yet, please do so. If you are not subscribed, hit that subscribe button. Share this video with your friends and family if you think it would be of value to them. We will do another stream later this week, Thursday or Friday. And we will do a member stream right after that. So if you have a green name, you can participate. You can be there for the member stream uh, where we kind of hang out, shoot the breeze. And I don't monologue for an hour. We just hang out. I answer questions directly. It's a lot more chatty. And uh, we just kind of hang out. And that's a private stream for those who have chosen to subscribe to the channel. Again, you don't have to do that because we'll still do a public stream just before that. Thanks for hanging out with me on a Sunday. This is not normally a day when we broadcast, but if everyone likes doing Sunday streams, maybe we'll start having a little Bitcoin church. Bitcoin and macro church with TX. But I'm going to let you guys go. It's a beautiful day. I don't want to be on here all, to, all the whole time. I don't want to keep you for a long stream. So I thank you for being here. Make sure you leave feedback for me in the comments. I do read every comment to all of my videos.
My DMs are open. If you have a verified account on Twitter, you can send me a DM. It's not open to everyone, but if you verify yourself, you can send me a DM if you have any questions. And we'll talk again in just a few days, guys, later on this week. Really appreciate the support. Thank you for being here. Thank you for giving me a platform to express my views um, and for hanging out. So until we meet again, take care of yourselves, friends. Take care of each other. Get outside before the weekend is over. Enjoy some of the, it's beautiful weather here. And I'll talk to you guys in just a few days. Cheers, everyone.